a problem when I'm already wiping sweat off my brow and we haven't even started yet. It's not that warm. All right, so here we go. It has been... Oh, you know what? Brother, I appreciate that, but if, I don't want you guys to be cold. Um, Gospel of John, we've been 20 weeks removed uh, from this Gospel and just taking a side step to cover the armor of God. Uh, pray that series was a blessing to you. It was a blessing to me just in studying it out. It was a reminder for me to fortify the things that uh, I find wanting in my life. And there are things that are definitely found wanting in my life. So I uh, was able to mainly strengthen prayer for me was the big lesson. Um, and so the Lord's been uh, taking care of me in that. And I've been more time on my knees, uh, back to fasting. And my wife will freak out when she knows how much I plan to fast again. But, you know, it is what it is. Uh, now back to John. We're, so 20 weeks, which means what? You've pretty much forgotten everything that we've looked at, or just about everything. So I just really quickly, I want to go through reviewing chapter to chapter real quick, best we can. Um, why don't we, I'm going to ask Brother Tom to open us up in prayer, if you don't mind, sir. Amen, amen. Let's move this up a little bit. All right, so John chapter 1. Let's, let's start there. I know I told you to go to 7, but let's start with John 1. Three extremely important verses. Not that there are verses of the Bible that aren't important, but these are three extremely important ones found in John chapter 1. First one, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Word, capital W. Who are we referencing here? The Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Word of God that Revelation 19 says will return on a white horse with His saints following behind. Probably doing this. Woo! Had to cover up the mic, you know. What blow people away. That's what I plan to do anyhow. I don't know, maybe he'll change my mind. But I plan to really be excited. Uh, verse 14, And the Word, Jesus, was made flesh. And dwelt, and that's how he was given the name Jesus, by the way. He was the Word of God. He was, he was God the Son in eternity past. And then he was made flesh and he became Jesus. Dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and true. How did the people of his day um, see his glory, behold his glory? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So what did they behold? Sinlessness in the man Christ Jesus. They beheld His glory. And He was full of both grace and truth. Something um, most of us pastors need to learn how to find a balance. We're usually one or the other. Amen? It's, need to find a balance like Jesus. And uh, very important verse. Uh, God's creation took on flesh, became man to die for man's sins, but, verse 12, as many as received him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. You must be born again, and we're going to get to that. So, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Why? Because you're not until you receive Jesus. I know we talk about that. The world talks about that. We're all children of God, isn't it? You know, what does it matter who we worship as long as we worship something? We're all God's children, blah, 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 ad nauseum. We're not. We're estranged from God according to Scripture. So we need to get adopted into that family. Well, he's not going to adopt a rebel. He made a door into his, uh, his home. And that door is Jesus. Jesus said, I am the door. We'll see as uh, we get through John that he will say that of himself. John chapter 2. Uh, 
<laughs> One of the more famous chapters in all of the Bible. Why? Not that they know much about it. They've never probably read it, but everybody's heard that Jesus turned water into wine. And of course, so Jesus begins his uh, miracles here in the second chapter uh, with this very act, turning water into wine, uh, which we saw when we looked at it. Was, it this isn't about booze hounding. Jesus, I don't believe he turned water into alcohol. I believe he turned it into wine. You say, well, what's the difference? There's a grand difference. The Bible gives you two f forms of the word wine. It, it, there is alcoholic and there's non-alcoholic. If Jesus, being the great high priest of our profession, if he served alcohol, he would be a sinner. That's what the law would teach. Jesus did not sin. They beheld his glory. He didn't sin. He gave them the fruit of the vine, a non-fermented uh, uh, wine. Uh, and so what we saw when we studied it was really what this was about. This was a picture of the new birth. And we studied the whole thing out. I don't want to go into it for now. John 3, look at the first uh, seven verses. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Nicodemus hadn't even seen the half of what Jesus would perform. What did he do? He turned water into wine. That was enough for Nicodemus. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Whoop, change the subject. Let's not talk about miracles right now. It was all out the blue, a new birth message to a very religious man. Maybe a good man by human standards. Verse 4, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, there's the first birth, and of the Spirit, there's your second birth, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Again, born, born of water, there's your flesh of flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. There's your born of the Spirit of verse 5. So you just line the verses up. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. So the born again message is delivered here. Famous, famous of course. Uh, religious man confuses the spiritual with the literal and the literal with the spiritual. And we talked about how we would see that over and over and over again. And we have. Already, in seven chapters, we've seen people confusing the words of Jesus Christ. We're going to continue to see that today. Listen, religion blinds people almost as much as pride. And sometimes they go hand in hand. I want to see the truth. I've always wanted the truth. I hope you want the truth. Look at verse 16. Come on, you know this. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You want to know how inspired this Bible is? For God, circle the G, so loved the world that He gave His only, circle the O, begotten Son, circle the S, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, circle the P, but have everlasting, circle the E, life, circle the L. What does that spell? In order. Gospel. Right in the verse. This is God's signature right on that verse. Now, I don't know what the mathematical odds are that it would happen in order in a verse that is referring to the gospel, but I think you saw a miracle this morning. Verse four, uh, chapter 4, Jesus offers salvation to a woman considered unclean by national standards, by racial standards. Which proves what? That the gospel of Jesus Christ transcends race. It, it transcends country of origin. Our country needs this lesson right now. And the reason that races are fighting in our own country is because they don't have the common denominator. Jesus Christ. Where, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, 
barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Colossians 3 and verse 11. So you get in Christ and all of a sudden uh, you can have light skin, dark skin, you can belong to this country or that country, and none of that matters anymore because now I am from a heavenly home and I have a heavenly Father and He created us all and it doesn't matter what color my skin is. Praise the Lord. Chapter 5. We see a helpless man. Uh, he is lame, cannot move of his own self. It's a picture of a man lost in his sins. He cannot save himself. He has no one that he knows of that cares enough about him to help, it, help save him. If they could get him to the water, none of them care to. And along comes Jesus. He has the compassion and the ability to save both the mighty princes of the earth and the downtrodden outcasts of society. Touching people that no one else would touch. Embracing people no one else would embrace. Healing people no one else would or could heal. And delivering them from the bonds of sin. And he did that for this man. Praise the Lord. Then in chapter 6, Oh, what do we see in chapter 6? We see Jesus feed 5,000. Now there's a miracle. We see him walking on water. We see him or read about him giving a sermon of him being the bread of life. The likes of which have been misunderstood and misapplied. Ready? Here's, here's where it's going to get hot for some of you and where I'm going to be considered mean. And I don't intend to be mean. I just got to give you the truth. Uh, but where the likes of the Roman Catholic Church and the Episcopalian Church and the Anglican Church and the Lutheran Churches and some Presbyterian Churches uh, starts making this wafer about actually eating the physical body of Jesus Christ. They are wrong. And they misapply John chapter 6 Again, to teach something in a literal sense that Jesus meant in a spiritual sense. It's just what religion does. That's what they do with the Word of God. They take that which is so clearly, obviously, literal and say, eh, make it mean whatever you want. And they take what the, the, a spiritual lesson and they say, now take that literally. It's just, it just is. I don't know what else to say about it, but I'll tell you what. Verse 63. Jesus said, if it matters what Jesus said. Because yes, he did, he did say, Whoso, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up the last day. Again, they run with verse 54. Well, you can't run with verse 54. You've got to run it in its context. And in verse 63, he said, It is the Spirit that quickeneth, Wait a minute, it, it, what does quickeneth mean? Makes alive. It's not a wafer. You need to be born of the Spirit, as John 3 talked about. It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. Nothing. Nothing you do in this flesh will profit you in the eyes of Almighty God. The words that I speak, including verse 54. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. This isn't literal. It's spiritual. And I offer you life through it. It's just right there. It's right there. If we'll just, oh, if we would just cast aside the filthy garments of religion to see the truth from the Word of God. It's what we need. And as we entered into the seventh chapter, and we did enter into the seventh chapter before we took a break, we found Jesus, of course, instantly at odds with religious leadership of his day. I wonder if there's a church in America or around the world that Jesus could walk into today and not have some reason to be at odds with them. The last verse... I can tell you this, just to, if, I can, if I'm allowed to, I've always been told never to 
reveal your hand as a as a pastor, but your your pastor's a pretty down to earth kind of guy. So I'm just I think the Lord would be at odds with me over a great deal of things. I'm not perfect. So I, I would just I think the best thing for us to do is to just humble ourselves. Amen. To read this book, to admit where we fall short, to confess it, to forsake it the best we can, ask the Lord for grace and mercy, and ask Him to help us not to stay there any longer. So I think yeah, He would be at odds with a number of us here today. And I think if He can be at odds with me, I think He could be at odds with any one of us. Last verse and the last message that we did out of John 7 was verse 24. Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. This verse clearly reveals that Jesus actually taught people to judge. That's how the verse starts. Judge. Judgment is not wrong. It is referred to in the scripture as discernment. It is a good thing. However, he gave us a couple of prerequisites. And the one here in this verse is to not judge according to appearance. Our modern equivalent is judge not a book by its cover or don't judge a book by its cover, right? We've heard that. We've said it probably. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't open up the book and read it and discern the contents of the pages. And when you do so, the second prerequisite would be found in Matthew chapter 7. And when you find something that you fall short of, just be careful how you wag that finger at others. So don't be a hypocrite. John, uh, Matthew 7 isn't about not judging. It's about not judging hypocritically. So that's when you ought to just kind of... Right? Jesus taught, for of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Therefore, the content of one, one's heart can be openly on display if you'll sit down and actually use the ears that God gave you instead of the mouth and just listen to them and hear them talk. And they will express exactly what's in their heart if you'll receive it. They'll let you know. Even though they don't know how much they've let you know. Now, as we pick back up in John 7, Jesus is still in the midst of Hot discussion with religious leadership. Religious leadership, who? Scribes. Those are people who penned out copies of the law of Moses. Uh, lawyers. Those, you, know, you know what lawyers were back in the day? They weren't like our, they're just as sleazy. Sorry if you're a lawyer. Um, but what they did was they strove over the details of the law of Moses and found loopholes around it. Just as sleazy. Right? We got law today in our country, and you got lawyers who try to get criminals off the hook. That's sleazy lawyering to me. Uh, Pharisees, those are the, you know, I guess for lack of better terms, the legalists. It's a dangerous word to use, um, but uh, certainly hypocritical um, and uh, standards driven. And then you have the Sadducees who were um, religious leaders who liked to cut parts of the Bible out because they didn't like to believe all of it. We got, we got all of these people still today. Scribes are just, they're just guys that now write books that correct the Bible. Lawyers are who I said they were. Pharisees are found in every church making up standards that they applied and must be lived out in the lives of others that they themselves won't touch with one of their fingers. And then you got Sadducees, people who like to take stuff out of the Word of God. Um, and these discussions, this heated debate that will go on with um, these religious leaders, it will go on all the way through John chapter 8. So we got a lot to look at that's probably not going to be fun or comfortable. Um, but th please don't let anyone fool you. Jesus was not okay with all religions. He was not okay with all leadership. I don't think he would be okay with every pastor, even in every Baptist church. 
I think there's, he would have a lot of problems with a lot of people because a lot of us live this life more in the flesh than we do in the spirit. So when it comes to the stubborn leadership and those who taught others to do that which is contrary to the word of God, Jesus was and I believe will be extremely harsh. So question, ready for some controversy? You can't study Jesus and his gospels and his words without controversy. It's impossible. All right, so that, that was all by way of introduction. You said, great, here we are. We're going to be here forever. Okay, verses 25 through 27. We'll do what we can to move you along. Okay, we caught up on John, right? Okay, so then verses 25 through 27. He's in the temple now, okay? And uh, he's preaching, as we saw. The last part was judge not according to appearance, verse 24, but judge righteous judgment. Then said some of them of Jerusalem... Is not this he whom they seek to kill? Who, who is this guy? Who is, is this that Jesus that they're all talking about killing? Apparently it must be priv they must be privy of this information, right? That, that someone is wanting him dead. But lo, he speaketh boldly. What does that mean? He, what, he's not a, isn't this the guy they plan to kill? And he's standing right here speaking? Wow, he's pretty brave. That's, that's the point. And they say nothing unto him. Nothing to him. They're talking about him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is very Christ? Hmm. Howbeit, we know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. So what do you got going on here? You have people, and by the way, I, I labeled this, um, this sermon today, if you can even call it that, temple chatter. People sitting around talking about Jesus, forming their own opinions. And that's what's going on here. You've got some religious people. They're hanging out in Jerusalem. They're hanging out at the temple. They are religious through and through. They have some heated water cooler debates and discussions one with another. And it's all about Jesus. Of course, he's right there in their presence preaching and rebuking. By the way, two things pastors who are supposed to be like unto Jesus refuse to do in these days. Preaching and, te and, and rebuking. Preaching and rebuking. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. I know it's not popular, but it, it, it's needful. And while he's doing so, they're discussing him behind his back. Sharing um, what I could only say is ignorant opinions. Because what I find them saying, um, it, it's like so many religious people. Taking the word of God as their standard and arguing for things that aren't even in it and arguing against things that are. It's been going on for 2,000 years. It's been going on for 4,000 years. It's been, it has, church, it has been going on in churches for 2,000 years. It's arguing. But they're, they're absolutely, I'm going to bring it into the modern day now. They're absolutely convinced they're right because they read it on Facebook and they watched it on YouTube. You know, because they don't go to church anymore because they can't find a church anymore that has a pastor that is good enough for them or people that are good enough for them. So they found somebody on YouTube. And then they don't have to get money. Praise the Lord. Save that for the back pocket. And they can just listen to the guy that can't get, to, he can't get into a church anywhere and isn't willing to put the work in and start one. So he just puts up videos on YouTube. Anyhow, just translating it for us into our day. Say, Pastor, you put stuff on YouTube. Yes, I do. But I'm also pastoring. So <laughs> just watch. Ten years from now, I'll be that guy. Um, keep talking this way, and I will be. It's just funny to me to be a fly on the wall um, in this conversation here because we can clearly see what the Bible says um, of, these, of these men here. Listen, these are men that will contradict and oppose themselves. At every turn. That's what 2 Timothy 2.25 talks about. How so? Look at verse 27 as the debate of, amongst these people uh, continues to go forth. Um, it says, Howbeit we know this man whence he is, when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. This information uh, spoken by an unnamed source, clearly religious again, uh, maybe learned it from his local priest, his local pastor, someone on Facebook again. Look at verse 42 now. 
Flip all the way over to verse 42. Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? Sure did. How do we know? Micah 5 and verse 2 says it. Way before he was born. That he'd be born in Bethlehem of Judea. O Bethlehem Ephrata. That's, that's where he was born. And around the water cooler, the debate goes as people ignorantly and incorrectly know or think about God. It's just how it goes. So someone's arguing, oh, nobody knows where the Christ is going to come from. The other person actually has some information and says, no, wait a minute, doesn't Micah, right? <laughs> oh, well, I don't know. I just think he's, I don't know what Micah says, but I just think we won't know. Right? Come on. That's how the argument goes. So they still, right, he's right, God manifests in the flesh, is right there. Within earshot, they could walk up to him, talk to him, ask him questions that they're saying, well, is this the Christ? Is this not the Christ? I don't know. I don't know. Couldn't you walk up to him and talk to him and ask him the question instead of talking about him? Same thing with the Bible. People know about the Bible and know about Jesus, the things they've read about them. Not the thing, they've not read the Bible about Jesus. And they've not read the Bible to know the Bible. They read blogs. You know, that Bible's filled with contradictions. Really? Can you show me one, please? Give me a minute. Get up Google. Contradictions in the Bible. Well, I got like 10 sites. Boom, that one. Hey, okay, so we've got this contradiction. I, I can, anytime they do, I can answer those contradictions. They're trite. They're silly. They're not contradictions at all. You're just reading it out of its context. Pick the Bible up. Don't tell me what you know about the Bible when you've never read it. Don't tell me what you know about Jesus when the only authority on him you've never read. I don't go into, I don't, I've never, ever walked into Ford when I was bringing my car in for repair and told the mechanic how to fix my car. Well, I think you need new brakes. I just don't think so. <laughs> Fine. See you in the hospital. Right. Why, do, why do we do that with men who have studied to show themselves approved? Why do we go up to somebody who's read the Bible 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 times and go, I really just don't think so? When they've never read it once. We don't do that with anything else. You wouldn't tell a surgeon how to perform your surgery. You wouldn't tell a doctor how to diagnose you. You wouldn't tell a mechanic how to fix your car. You would go to the authority and you would trust them. And if they're wrong, they're wrong. But guess what? The authority on all matters of faith? Not me. So go to it. Don't go to the guy blogging about it. Go to it. Amen. All right, so all that, just, just to have some fun. Verses 28 and 29. See, and you preach this way and you get a bad reputation. Because it sounds mean. It's not mean. I just believe the book. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he was taught, saying, You both know me, and you know whence I am. I am, I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom you know not. Ouch. Who is he saying? You don't know God. Because the Father sent him. <laughs> just throws in there, just, to, just, just as a little extra, mm, whom you know not. But I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. So he and I'm, I'm being loud because it says, then cried Jesus in the temple. You both know me! And you know whence I am. He goes into this, he starts crying in the temple. Praise the Lord. He's lifting up his voice like a trumpet. <laughs> Out of nowhere, the ability to read thoughts. 
They weren't talking to him. They were talking about him behind his back. Jesus begins to preach out loud in the midst of the temple. The very topic of discussion taking place behind his back. How do you not love Jesus? I love reading about him. He just he could so get a man. You can't play chess with Jesus. It's checkmate before, you, before he makes a move. Right? Because he knows where you're going before you know you're going there. And we've discussed this previously. I want you to look at it again because I love this verse. It's such, a, it's such a great verse. Proverbs 20 and verse 27. Keep your place here. I, don't, I must have read the Bible 40 times before this verse ever, like, I read it one day and went, this was in the Bible? You ever had that, you know, you've read it over and over and over again, and all of a sudden the verse is like, I don't ever remember reading this verse. The Lord just, he kept it back until he wanted you to have it, that's all. Uh, but it's verse 27, Proverbs 20 and 27. It says, the spirit of man, right, where we are spirit, soul, and body, that's how he made us. Okay? The spirit of man, not the Holy Spirit, but the spirit put in man, is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. So the Lord put with, within each and every one of us a human spirit. And you want to know how God can read your heart? It's by that spirit. You say, well, how does that happen? I don't know. I didn't make the spirit. I don't know how he lights the candle in every man. But if he wants to, he can shine down onto the recesses of our heart and know the inward thoughts. Frightening. Amen. That's Almighty God. You ought to, we ought to be afraid of God. So that's, that's what he put within us. Now look at John 2. Which we've looked at, and I've you know, brought you to this section a number of times, because I just want to show you who Jesus is. Uh, verse 23, start there. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Why did he know what was in man? Because he is the Lord that put the Spirit as a candle in man. He's your creator. So Jesus didn't, he didn't need anyone to come by and go, hey Lord, do you know something about him? I'm going to tell you some information about him. Like, yeah, I already know. And I know a few things that you don't know. Amen. Because he's God. So, praise the Lord. He put that candle within. If humanity could just wrap their mind around this. Uh, look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. I have to constantly remind myself of this. Just about, about our Jesus. I know we love this verse because it's a King James verse and, it, and it, um, uh, it's, it's a deity verse. But 1 Timothy 3.16, it's like unto John 1.1, 1, 1, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. It doesn't say was and will be. In other words, there won't be another... God, God the Father won't manifest in the flesh. God the Spirit won't manifest in the flesh. He was. It happened in a moment of time some 2,000 years ago. But He always is from henceforth. But God, God, this is what I'm saying. We need to wrap our minds around this because we say it, I think, so flippantly. God became a man. That ought to be so mind-blowing to us that we just stop and think about that every so often. God became a man. Why? Well, it wasn't, listen, it wasn't, according to Scripture, just to die for your sins. It was so he could learn. He needed to learn obedience. What? That's what the Scripture teaches. Obedience what? In the flesh. He needed to identify. Because what, what is the weakness of, what is our weakness? Flesh. Spirit indeed is willing, the flesh is weak. 
What, as, as, if when we get born again, what continues to sin in us? Flesh. That's what Paul explained to us. So God became flesh so that He could identify. See how hard it is. Learn obedience to bring that flesh, which is so difficult for all of us, amen, to bring it into obedience despite all of the temptations that befell Him. It never sinned once. And then went to that cross. Died for our sins. We need to start thinking about that every just once in a while. That God became man. That was, that was driven in love. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. It was driven by love. Which is charity. Love in action. Um... Should you discuss this topic with someone, especially, a, again, a religious somebody, they'll say something like, well, you know, I believe Jesus was a good man. We've all heard that, right? How do you know? You've read this where? What do you know about Jesus? Oh, I don't know. It's just he was a good man. Based on what? How do you know every once in a while he didn't just walk around and slap somebody in the face? Well, I don't, I don't know. Well, what, have you, what do you know about him? I don't know. He's a good man. Was he good when he said, unless you re repent, you shall all likewise perish? No, he was only good when he said, judge not. <laughs> right? I believe Jesus was a prophet. Really, what did he prophesy of? Well, I... I don't, I don't know. I know you don't know. That's why I'm asking you. Well, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but I don't believe He was actually God. Okay, well, there's more Bible ignorance. Let me show you why. Go to John 5. Verse 18. There is so much that God wants you to know, church, lost. There is so much God wants you to know. He put 66 books together for you. Compiled it all into one neat little volume that you can get at the dollar store for a buck. You got more money for your Tim Hortons than you do for the Word of God. But Jesus answered them, verse 17, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him, because not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father. See, he's the son of God, right? Making himself equal with God. And there it is. They got it, right? That's why they wanted to kill him. They thought he blasphemed. Just by saying, the father is my father. No one referred to Jehovah as their father. He was the almighty. He was the creator. He was Jehovah Jireh and all those other things that they called him. But he was never father. But now, in Christ, for you and for me, he is Abba, Father. It's good. But that, I'm just telling you, people don't, they don't know. They don't know. Listen, for, your creator, your creator came in a body of flesh. He came as a Jewish carpenter 2,000 years ago. Hands probably a leather working with wood all of his life. Imagine if he did come around slapping people. Wouldn't feel good. Born into the very lineage prophesied of him. Uh, hundreds, centuries, centuries before he was born. Nearly a thousand years before he was born. Into the, uh, into the lineage into the very town he was prophesied of, again, centuries before, lived as it was said of him, died as it was said of him, bearing your sins and mine in the process, coming up out of that grave three days and three nights later, proving his divinity. And guess what? It is very, very nearly the third day. And if you don't know what I mean by that, there's a sermon out of this series called, either the, I think it's called The Third Day. Get it. And you'll see that the Lord's return is nigh. Your redemption, church, come on, your redemption draweth nigh. 
in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, that Jewish carpenter, God manifest in the flesh, is going to start shouting. And I believe you put Song of Solomon, the book of John, and Thessalonians, and Revelation all together, and I think he's going to start shouting your name. Like he did with Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. Just add, just add, rise up, my love. In a moment. And we'll get to see that Jewish carpenter that I've been preaching for the last 20 years. Can't wait to see him. Are you going to call that bride up by, by name? I believe he's going to call us by name. Call us up. Bring us through the ringer for a few minutes. Present us before the Father. Here's my bride. We'll get married there, and then he'll have supper here. And the nations of the earth will tremble when we all come back together. It's all in the Bible. All that's in the Bible. Verses 30 and 31. Back to chapter 7. Uh, where am I? Right. Okay, so he's preaching. Verses 30, 31. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. So God the Father intervened. They wanted to kill him. Uh, the Father kept that from happening. And many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? So I'm trying to move quickly through these verses. I know I'm not doing a great job. But here's what you'll want to note of these two verses. Again, dealing with religious leadership, they saw Jesus as a threat. A threat um, to their authority. They were jealous of him, and therefore they sought to kill him. The ordinary average person you see in verse 31, they thought of Jesus very differently. You know, oh man, I'll tell you, it makes me wonder about even our, our group. I, I love our church. I love the King James only churches. I love them. And then I see, you know, some downtrodden people who just have a different attitude towards Jesus than the people who are straight laced and who are doing the best they can to live right. I just see a different attitude with us. I, the the average the ordinary I don't want us to be so I don't want us to be so straight laced that we just lose our, lose our first love I don't want us to be the Ephesian church straight laced is good but not in forsaking the love of God in the process so I just the average people they just man I think leadership would kick Jesus out of the church. I think a lot of leaders would in our own churches. And I think Jesus would have to go out to the bus stop and sit down with someone who got saved at a VBS 50 years ago and the rest of their life was in tattered and ruins and sitting there smoking a cigarette waiting for the bus to show up. But I think he'd be received there. Religious people are jealous of Jesus. Um, and I think that jealousy makes us become real religious um, in the sense of even us, our group. Uh, that everything's about church. The church is this, the church is that. Come to the church. Why isn't the church about Jesus? 
And I just think that any group, I don't care what denomination they're a part of, that claims the name of Jesus, but would get jealous over the things that Jesus actually taught in the Bible and would get angry over the things that Jesus taught in the Bible as if it was hurting their church. That's antichrist. That is the mystery of iniquity. That is the spirit of antichrist in the churches. It's not a religion that comes from God. Any group, any pastor that would keep the gospel of Jesus Christ at bay in order to make sure that the churches got filled and the money kept flowing is antichrist. And let me show you in a verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Why would you hide the gospel, especially when somebody puts a microphone in your face and asks you to give it? In front of millions of people on Larry King Live. And you don't even need to know the name of the preacher. Is Jesus the only way? Coward. You're hiding that you could, you had a free shot. Millions of people. My leg would have been bouncing. I would have been so nervous, excited. Woo! Okay, well, all right, Larry, let me hold on a second here. Let me just gather my thoughts. 2 Corinthians 4. Man! I'm still waiting for the archdiocese to invite me in to speak sometime. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 through 5. But if our gospel, that's, is, it our, is it yours? It's our gospel. If it be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves. Look at that verse that follows. It's not about you. It's not about your church. It's not about your sacraments. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. That doesn't sound like a whole lot of pastors and priests out there, now does it? It ought to be. So if someone is preaching themselves or their religion or their church or their mother church or whatever it is, and uh, it's a cult and it's antichrist and it is led by the God of this world who is Satan who wants to blind people from the truth so that they're damned forever. Again, thank you Larry King. I would love the opportunity. Please invite me anytime. I'm all there. So I would just say, good warning for pastors of today. Make this about these two things. Boaz and Jacob, which are representatives of the Bible and Jesus Christ. That's what every church needs to be about. It needs to promote the Word of God. It needs to instill faith in the people as they hear it, as it's taught. It needs to, we need to be built up on our most holy faith and Jesus Christ needs to take the center of it all. He paid it all. I didn't pay anything. So let him, I'll tell you, oh, would to God he walked through these doors. Look at verse 32. The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. What is that saying? They heard people saying, is this the Christ? And they said, we can't have that. They're in the temple and all. Not talking about the temple. They're in the temple. Not talking about us, the scribes and Pharisees. They're in the temple. Talking about the Christ. We can't have that.
I would love for the Lord to walk through those doors. I, this is, I'm not trying, this isn't a boost of me. But I would gladly relinquish the pulpit. The only thing that you'll have a problem with me after that is fighting for the front row. Because I will claw your eyes out to get there. Just <laughs> so you know. I want to get as close to Jesus as I possibly can. Verses 33 through 36. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while I am with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. So he's talking now directly to the Pharisees who were murmur, uh, murmuring. Um, Yet a little while I am with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me, and where I am thither ye cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go, that we shall not find him? Will he go to the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this that he said? Ye shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am thither ye cannot come. <laughs> More of what we talked about. Which is what? Not knowing how to interpret what Jesus said. Religious, through and through, simply don't understand Jesus. They don't know him, so they can't get him. They confuse his words. They muddy up his doctrine. Jesus was prophesying of his own death at their hands. And he was letting them know that after they killed him, they wouldn't be allowed where he was going. Ouch. He prophesied that those who loved him would seek for an appearance of his resurrected self. And he prophesied directly to them that hated him that they would seek for a dead body after the tomb turned up empty. You're going to seek for me. You that are going to kill me, you're going to seek for me. And you won't find me. I'm not going to be there. Grave can't hold a sinless man. Praise the Lord. He rose. And we'll, we'll, stu we'll study all that. Worst fear that they could possibly have. Guard that, guard that tomb. We don't want the body to disappear. People are going to actually think he rose. He did. And they couldn't stop it. So they're going to make up some stuff. We'll see that later on as we get to the end. All right, we've got to close here. So, today I want to make this about, you say, what? Can I just do this? Welcome to Bible Believers Baptist Church, where you don't necessarily get three points in a poem. Right? I mean, this, this was all over the place. It was just, like I called it, temple chatter. What we do here, by and large, it's just study the Bible. And we go verse by verse by verse by verse. And we don't skip over the verses because I just believe that God gave us those verses for us to look at. So we go through verse by verse by verse by verse. And if I'm going to end with a point, uh, today's message basically, I mean, it was twofold. It was one to get us back on track in our study of John because we've been away for so long. But if you'll allow me to put us all on trial this morning, myself included, we could examine ourselves in light of these verses, could we not? These were men who were religious, but they did not know Jesus. And they did not want to, to promote the name of Jesus in their temple, in their church, in their assembly. So I'd ask you this morning, do you know Jesus? Not because I want to say, I'm great because I do. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with those of us who here are born again and know Jesus. It has nothing to do with that. Do you know Jesus? I ask you that question because it's needful for your soul. Amen. Or are you just religious? Bouncing around church every once in a while when I feel like going. Because you know, I heard that's what I'm supposed to do. I got family that goes. So I probably should go. Do you know about Jesus? Do you know about the Jesus from the Word of God? Or do you know about Jesus from what somebody else told you? Let me put it to you this way. Think of someone on earth that you claim to know and you claim to know well. And just imagine that 
when confronted, you found out that though you thought his or her, whoever that person may be, that their favorite color was blue and you found out years later, oh, it was red? All these years I thought it was blue. No. You never asked me. Favorite color is red. And you thought, hey, what, what your favorite restaurant's Olive Garden, right? No, it's Red Lobster. I've, n- I've never even gone to Olive Garden. Hate pasta. When you thought their favorite sport was football and found out it was golf. Just on and on and on down the line. Just trying to make this understandable for us. And you found out that that person that you really believed many things about, I mean truly in your heart, believed, I thought this was true. You come to find out they weren't true. Well then you've got to really ask yourself this question. Did I really know that person? And so I'll ask you again, do you know Jesus? Do you know what he said? Do you know what he taught, what he preached? Do you know how he lived? Or do you think you know the answer to those questions and aren't really sure for yourself? Get sure. One last set of verses for today. I'm going to let you go. Promise. Matthew 7. Matthew 7. There will be people who think they know Jesus. Who will stand before him upon his return. And he will actually let them know that they didn't know what they thought they knew. And that he never knew them. Look at verse 21, Matthew 7. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. What's the will of the Father in heaven? That you'd believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. That's his will. You can read it all through the New Testament. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what you did in his name. And in thy name cast out devils? Again, doesn't matter. And in thy name done many wonderful works? Okay, you, me, 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 I did, I did, I did, I did. Yeah, I've stamped your name on it, but I did it. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So you've got to ask yourself this question. Do you do things in hopes of everlasting life, even with Jesus' name stamped on it? Or do you know him and he know you? It's not about what you've done. It's about who you know. We sang that song, I am his and he is mine. I hope you can say that truthfully. That you know him. That you're intimate with with him. That when he speaks out of the word of God, you just go, oh, that's my Savior talking to me right now. Oh, Lord, speak for thy servant heareth. Or do you just know about him? Hear me now. Your eternity is at stake. What did you do with Jesus? Not what church did you attend? Not where were you baptized? Not what did you make a confirmation at 13? What did you do with Jesus? And the good news is you can know him right here, right now. I don't do this eyes closed. I, you know, I don't do that stuff. You want to know Jesus? Yeah, Brother Tom DePerno, wave your hand at us, brother. Uh, future deacon of the church. Good man, knows the Lord. Got Brother Joe Hork, Brother Joe Meddy, a number of people here that know Jesus Christ. You don't need eyes closed. If you're embarrassed of Jesus Christ and you need me to have everyone close their eyes, no, if you want to be saved, just come to us and say, I want to be saved. I want to, I want to know. I want my soul secure. Come up to us. We'll talk to you. We'll show you the scriptures. We'll pray with you. And we'll make this thing solid. And then don't be ashamed to tell somebody, I'm born again. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What a great promise of good news. You could have that right here, right now. And the name of the Lord is not Allah, it's not Buddha, it's not Krishna. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is 
near. All right, Father, thank you.